have for you this morning is, who would you say that Jesus is? We've been in this Advent season now. This is the third Sunday of Advent. We've been taking this time to look forward to celebrate Christmas and considering the significance of the holiday that we celebrate together. And over the last couple of weeks, uh, Pastor Tony's been preaching through this Advent series, talking about the distractions that we are constantly bombarded with at this time of year. Money, gifts, debt, spending, sales, shopping, all the things that go along with the season. And then we also heard Pastor Tony talk about how Jesus welcomed the outcasts of the society in his day. Those that were cast aside, those hated by their own people, like Matthew and Zacchaeus, who were both tax collectors. But also in these people, we heard of the true and saving faith that they had in Jesus. And so last week, we were asked to consider if, if we were following Jesus like Matthew did, with that true saving faith. Or considering, do we put conditions on our own faith, unlike them? So as we continue in our Advent series, again is this thir- in this third Sunday of Advent, we will continue to look at Jesus. We will continue to consider who He was and who He is, and to consider His ministry on the earth. For how easy it can be to focus on everything else other than Jesus at this time of year as we celebrate Christmas. I was thinking back uh, in our household, and still to this day, I guess, we have the tradition, I'm sure many of you do as well, that on Sunday morning, we always read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2 before opening any gifts. And I know as a kid and all my brothers, we just really wanted to get through it as fast as possible so we could open the gifts together, and I'm sure many kids are the same way. And it's really just breezing through what should be our true focus. But as we have this Advent season, as we've had Advent the last couple weeks and this week, it's a time to prepare for Christmas and a time to prepare our hearts and our minds to get our focus in the right place, which is on Jesus. And so may we continue with that this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. So we're going to be reading again from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. So please uh, turn there with me as that's where we're going to be focusing the majority of our time this morning. Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. When Jesus had finished instructing the twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, this is John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, he said, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So these are the verses that we're going to be focusing on this morning. Before we dive right into this particular passage, just quickly consider the context that these verses fall into. You can flip back and flip forward if you like. But in chapter 11, it's where Jesus is preparing to send out his 12 disciples. As for the first few chapters of Matthew, he had been ministering to them. They had been ministering along with him. And he was going to send them out two by two to minister to the surrounding areas. And then throughout chapter 10, you see him speaking to them, continuing to teach them before they go out. Uh, In the verses following where we're looking at today, we see Jesus continuing to preach, to teach, and to continue to travel around that area uh, doing that. So as we look at the first verse here of chapter 11, as I mentioned, Jesus had been preparing to send out his disciples, and here he, he does send them out. But at the same time, he was not just going to take a break, but he was also continuing to move around to teach and to preach in the surrounding areas. So during this time, as Jesus had been ministering, as Jesus had been doing miracles, as Jesus had been preaching and teaching in the areas there, John the Baptist, who was in prison at that time, heard of Jesus' ministry and asked this question through his disciples, which is, as you see in verse 3, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? 
Again, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And this is a very important question and truly one that many have asked throughout history and still do today. Asking, is Jesus this one who is to come? Is he the promised Messiah who was foretold in the Old Testament that he would come as a Savior? Or was he just a man, as some would say? Or was he just a good teacher, as some people would say? Or just a prophet? Or is Jesus Christ truly fully God and fully man, the promised Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament? Is he the Savior of all mankind? Is he the Son of Man? Is he the Lamb of God? And if we believe that he is truly who he says that he is, then what does that mean for us this Christmas? Does he have the rightful place in our lives? Does he have his rightful place in our celebrations as we gather together? Does he hold his rightful place in our lives as king, as our Lord, as our only Savior? And what does this mean for us this Christmas as we remember the humble, lowly birth of our Savior as we ta they talked about this morning as he was in a stable, laid in a manger? Does it hold its rightful significance in our lives as we do consider Jesus' birth at Christmas time? Like I said, we were kind of focusing on the context a little bit at the beginning, but we haven't been preaching through Matthew. But the Gospel of Matthew focuses a lot on the prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus' life on earth, these prophecies from the Old Testament. So just a couple quotes. One from John MacArthur is he says, Matthew repeatedly uses this phrase, might be fulfilled, to indicate ways in which Jesus and the events related to his earthly ministry were fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy. These basic truths and happenings of the New Testament were culminations, completions, or fulfillments of revelations that God had already made in the Old Testament. And also from the study notes, it says, Matthew crafted his account to demonstrate Jesus' messianic identity, his inheritance of the Davidic kin kingship over Israel, and, his, and the fulfillment made to his ancestor Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. Just note this next part especially, that this in large part, Matthew's gospel is an evangelistic tool aimed at his fellow Jews, persuading them to recognize Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. So really that's Matthew's focus, that he's, really his gospel serves to answer the question that is posed by John the Baptist here, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? As Matthew writes this gospel to answer the question without a doubt, to give a bounty of irrefutable evidence that Jesus was the Messiah that was promised, that he fulfilled these many, many messianic prophecies while he was on the earth. So that takes us through the first kind of three verses and takes us to verses 4 and 5 where we're going to spend quite a bit of time there. Where Jesus responds to this question that was posed by John by providing many of the messianic prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus' life. As we look at this passage this morning, as we consider this question that John asked, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? It is important to look at these verses that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament and also see how they were fulfilled in the New Testament. So just try to follow along. We're going to quickly flip through some of these passages as I think it's important to really see what Jesus is referring to both from the Old Testament and New. So mainly we're going to be in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. So if you stick one finger in Isaiah And then mainly in Matthew in the New Testament, but also some of the other Gospels. So keep one finger in Matthew, keep one finger in Isaiah. So the first thing that Jesus says is that the blind receive sight. So if you look at first Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18. So in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, again if you have... If you're taking notes, maybe write these verses down if you don't have a chance to keep up with the whole thing. But Isaiah 29, verse 18 says, in that, day, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. So that's one verse. The next, flip a few pages over to Isaiah 35. 
verse 5. Isaiah 35, verse 5, where it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And if you flip back to Matthew, we see this fulfilled in Matthew chapter 9. So again, we're talking about when Jesus said the blind receive sight. We saw this in two examples in Isaiah where it's promised that this is going to happen. Then we see in Matthew chapter 9 verses 27 to 31 as Jesus heals these blind men. So it says, And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. So that's the first example. Again, we saw the prophecy in the Old Testament and the fulfillment in the New. So the next, as Jesus says, the lame walk. So again, back to Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Isaiah 35, verse 6, where it says, Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So that's, again, the prophecy from the Old Testament. Flip back to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 30 to 31. Matthew 15, verses 30 to 31. It says, Great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Okay, so that's the lame walking. We saw again the, the prophecy and the fulfillment. The next, Jesus says that lepers are cleansed. This one was a little bit more difficult because there's not a specific really prophecy that says that, but if you, from what the research I did, it said there's a website called Verse by Verse Ministry International. So there's the chapter Leviticus, chapter 14. If you're familiar with the book of Leviticus, it talks a lot about laws. Uh, sacrifices, those types of things. So I'm just going to read this quote where it says, The book of Leviticus contains an entire chapter, chapter 14, devoted to how a Jew healed of leprosy must respond to the healing. But after centuries, the rabbis noticed that the rituals required by Leviticus 14 had never been used in all the history of Israel because no Jew had ever been healed of leprosy. This caused the rabbis to assume that this miracle could only be done by the Messiah when he arrived. So again, just to sum it up, Leviticus 14 is, describes how a Jew would respond if they had been healed of leprosy, but this never had happened in, throughout the whole Old Testament. So they said this must be something that could only be done by the Messiah to come. So this is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. It says, When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. So again, that shows both the fulfillment and Jesus also tells him to obey what it said in Leviticus 14 to go to the priest and offer the gift that was required. So that's another, that's three so far. Then we see Jesus say the death here. So again, we're going back to those same verses, Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 35. So Isaiah 29, 18, we already read this one, but in the first half of that verse it says, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book. And then also Isaiah 35, verse 5. We already read this verse as well, but to remind us, it says, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Uh, this also is fulfilled in one of the Gospels. Mark, chapter 7, 
If you flip over there, Mark chapter 7, verse 32 to 37. Mark chapter 7, verses 32 to 37. It says, Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven. He sighed and said to him, Oh boy. <clears throat> Ephatha. That is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So again, another fulfillment. That's the deaf hear, as Jesus said. Next, he says, the dead are raised. So again, back to Isaiah. Isaiah 26. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 18 to 19. Isaiah 26, 18 to 19 says, We were pregnant, we writhed, but we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not, have not fallen. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. So again, this prophecy, Isaiah says the dead will be raised. Now flip over to John, John 11, verses 38 to 44. This one might be familiar, might know where we're going, but this is where Jesus raises La his friend Lazarus from the dead. So again, I, sorry, John 11, verses 38 to 44. There's the whole story. I, can't, I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but focusing just on where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it says, Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I, know, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. And then finally, the last one we see here, is when Jesus says, the poor have good news preached to them. Again, from Isaiah chapter 61 now, so towards the end of the book. Isaiah 61 verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So again, this prophecy is that, as it says there, to bring good news to the poor. So looking at Matthew 5, verse 3, as part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, this part of the Beatitudes, the th verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Also in Luke, chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, verses thir verse 13, and then verse 21. So this is a parable of the great banquet. You might be familiar with it. We don't have time to read this whole passage, but Matthew, or sorry, Luke 14, thir verse 13 says, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And then again in verse 21 it says, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. 
And those are just a couple examples, but really if you look at Jesus and his whole ministry on earth, you'll see that he did not turn away anyone from any status of life, but he preached the good news to all people. So sorry, I know there's a lot of flipping back and forth. Perhaps you weren't able to keep up with the whole thing, but my purpose behind this was to really take a look at what Jesus is saying here and seeing that these things that he said are true, that there's these prophecies from the Old Testament and that they're fulfilled in Jesus' life so that we can understand that who Jesus was and that he did really fulfill these things that were promised. The Bible proves it, that Jesus is who he says he was. Jesus said it. So now the question for us today and moving forward is, will you believe? Will you believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah, spoken of in Isaiah, that this Christmas as we remember his birth, you would consider who Jesus truly is? And that if Jesus truly is who he says he is, that he is the one who is to come, the one who is promised, the Messiah, our Savior, that he was God himself, that he is the man of sorrows who was also spoken of in Isaiah. And that in Isaiah 9 where it says that he is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. If he is who he says that he is, what does this mean for us in our lives at this Christmas season? Do we give him his rightful place in our lives? Again, that is the question posed to us that we have to consider today. Or if you're not yet at the place where you have made that choice to surrender your life to Jesus, to confess with your mouth that He is Lord, and to believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, as it says in Romans 10 verse 9, what is holding you back? Do you believe that He is the one who is to come? Or are you still looking for another Savior in another way? Whichever place we find ourselves today, this Advent season leading into Christmas is the perfect time to again consider who is Jesus. And again, if we believe that He is who He says that He is, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our lives? What does that mean for our families? What does that mean for our church? What does that mean for the ways that we spend our lives, for the ways that we spend our free time, for every aspect of our lives? For if Jesus is who he unapologetically says that he is, God, Son of Man, Prince of Peace, Messiah, then he must affect every aspect of our lives. And this is, of course, as much a message for myself as for anyone else here this morning. But as Pastor Tony shared in the first two weeks of Advent, is our focus in this Christmas season on the gifts? Is it on the bills that are stacking up? Is it thinking about how we look to the outsiders? Are we putting limits on our faith? Are we putting limits on who Jesus is? Or are we just bogged down with the busyness of life at this time of year? Or is our focus truly on Jesus? The baby laid in the manger, forgotten, ignored, cast aside to the stable for there was no room in the inn. But may he not be cast aside in our lives, forgotten, but have the first place in our hearts. So now we look at the last verse here, verse 6, quickly, as it says, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Or in the NIV translation, it says, Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. And it, looking at this verse, it seems not to really fit in with the rest of these verses. It seems like it's kind of a change. Uh, but was likely was directed to John the Baptist who had posed this question to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come? From the ESV notes, it says that this verse was likely a, a mild rebuke towards John and his disciples, that they must be open to God's unfolding plan, even though Jesus' ministry did not look like their expectations necessarily were. Again, from the NDSB, it says, This verse was spoken to John, for he had only grasped half the truth. So Jesus says to John, Maybe I'm not doing the things you expected me to do, but the powers of evil are being defeated, not by irresistible power, but by unanswerable love. For sometimes people can be offended at Jesus because Jesus cuts across what their ideas of religion should be. Perhaps this has been the case for us in our lives at times. That when Jesus does not meet the expectations we have for him to act in our lives or to act on our behalf, it causes our faith to waver. 
It causes us to stumble. It causes us to question him and why he's not doing what we want him to do. But as we look at his, to his birth this season at Christmas, we see that from the beginning, from his birth when he came to earth, the Lord was not concerned with the expectations of man. He was not concerned to, about being born in pomp and circumstance, being born into royalty with a big show, with everybody there seeing what's happening, but rather a humble birth in a stable, placed in a manger. So instead of placing our expectations on Jesus and how he should act, this Christmas season, Advent, as we prepare our hearts, may we humbly come before him this Christmas season, seeking after him, Asking Him what in our lives should change. How we can learn to abide in Him more and more and more each day. And to faithfully follow Him and the plan that He has for our life. Again, as we approach Christmas and then New Year's, short after, shortly after, this time when people make resolutions that they likely will not keep past the end of January, May this season that we celebrate together and as we move into new, a new year, may it be a time for us to seek more of Jesus, to follow him faithfully, to remember daily the love that Jesus has for us, the love that God has for us, so much so that he sent his only son to earth to be born, to live, to die for our sins, to raise from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death in our lives, to ascend to heaven seated at the right hand of God the Father. Praise God and may we thank Him for this truth that we remember this Advent season as we prepare our hearts for Christmas and prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus' birth next week. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank You again so much this morning, Lord, as we have spent this time in Your Word considering who You are, Lord Jesus that we consider all that you fulfilled, these prophecies from hundreds and thousands of years before, that you fulfilled each and every one of them with your life on earth, that it's undeniable that you are the one who was to come, that you are the one who is to come, Lord, and that you live in heaven, Lord. And we thank you so much for your life. We thank you for your birth and that we can look back and consider who you are. Lord, and as we consider who you are from your word, I pray that we would consider what it means for our life whether it means seeking more of you, Lord, placing you in, in the rightful place in our lives, or whether it means choosing to follow you for the first time. I just pray that as we have this Advent season that we would truly consider this in our lives. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we...